Maggie O'Farrell needs no introduction, obviously, but I'm going to give you a tiny one because she did me a solid <laughs> in June of 2021 when we released Poured Over. Maggie was our first interview. And it had been a minute since I had done an interview, and I was reassured tonight in the green room that, in fact, it was not a total waste of her time, which I will take. <laughs> it was actually pretty great. I will say it was pretty great. Uh, for those of you I don't know, I'm Miwa Messer. I'm the producer and host of Poured Over, and I'm very happy to be back in East Chester. It's been a minute since I've been here. And Maggie, you are going to read a tiny bit. Oh. Yes. So I'm going to read from the first chapter, which is called A Wild and Lonely Place. Lucrezia is taking her seat at the long dining table, which is polished to a watery gleam and spread with dishes, inverted cups, a woven circlet of fur. Her husband is sitting down, not in his customary place, at the opposite end of the table, but next to her, close enough that she could rest her head on his shoulder, should she wish. He is unfolding his napkin and straightening a knife and moving the candle towards them both when it comes to her with a peculiar clarity, as if some coloured glass has been put in front of her eyes or perhaps removed from them, that he intends to kill her. She is sixteen years old, not quite a year into her marriage. They have travelled for most of the day, using what little daylight the season offers, leaving Ferrara at dawn and riding out to what he had told her was a hunting lodge, far in the northwest of the province. But this is no hunting lodge, is what Lucrezia had wanted to say when they reached their destination, a high-walled edifice of dark stone, flanked on one side by dense forest and on the other by a twisting meander of the Po River. She would have liked to turn in her saddle and ask, Why have you brought me here? She said nothing, however, allowing her mare to follow him along the path through dripping trees, over the arched back bridge and into the courtyard of the strange, fortified, star-shaped building, which seemed even then to strike her as peculiarly empty of people. The horses have been led away, she has removed her sodden cloak and hat, and he has watched her do this standing with his back to the blaze in the grate, and now he is gesturing to the country servants in the hall's outer shadows to step forward and place food on their plates, to slice the bread, to pour wine into their cups, and she is suddenly recalling the words of her sister-in-law delivered in a hoarse whisper, You will be blamed. Lucrezia's fingers grip the rim of her plate. The certainty that he means her to die is like a presence beside her, as if a dark feathered bird of prey has alighted on the arm of her chair. This is the reason for their sudden journey to such a wild and lonely place. He has brought her here to this stone fortress, to murder her. Astonishment yanks her up out of her body and she almost laughs. She is hovering by the vaulted ceiling, looking down at herself and him, sitting at the table, putting broth and salted bread into their mouths. He is setting an elbow on either side of the plate, telling her about coming to this lodge, as he persists in calling it, when he was a child how his father used to bring him hunting here. She is listening to a story about how he was made to release arrow after arrow towards a target on a tree until his fingers bled. She is nodding and making sympathetic murmurs of appropriate moments, but what she really wants to do is look him in the eye and say, I know what you are up to. Would he be surprised, wrong-footed? Does he think of her as his innocent, unworldly wife, barely out of the nursery? She sees it all. She sees that he has laid his scheme so carefully, so assiduously, separating her from others, ensuring that her retinue is left behind in Ferrara, that she is alone, that there are no people of the, from the Castello here, just him and her, two guards outside, and a handful of country servants to wait on them. How will he do it? Part of her would like to ask him this. The knife in a dark corridor, his hands about her throat, a tumble from a horse made to look like an accident. She has no doubt that all of these would fall within his repertoire. It had better be done well, would be her advice to him, because her father is not someone who will take a lenient view of his daughter's murder. She sets down her cup. She lifts her chin. She turns her eyes onto her husband, Alfonso, Duke of Ferrara, and she wonders what will happen next. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. All right, so we're in slightly familiar territory only because we're back in a literary footnote. <laughs> I mean, Hamnet, you've said before that Hamnet started when you sort of started to think of Shakespeare's kid as being an afterthought, and you were doing all of this reading and thinking, uh, you can't forget this kid. Yeah. Robert Browning wrote a poem about our Lucretia. So how old were you when you read that poem? 
I think I read it. I think I was an undergraduate at university. Mm -hmm. So I studied English literature Mm -hmm. and I remember really loving Robert Browning's dramatic monologues. Um, And they are something that I reread every now and again, Mm -hmm. especially when I'm between books, actually, I often reread them just because Mm -hmm. they're just so brilliant, aren't they? They're just, each one is a kind of little, a very small microcosm of perfection. You know, they're incredible psychological depth Mm -hmm. and amazing technical skill and just I don't know. And also, I find that they're quite, um, you know, obviously, it's a kind of form that he borrowed from the theatre. You know, he sort of examines the psychology of these people mm-hmm. who are often under some kind of emotional stress. But the one, the most, most famous one is My Last Duchess, which features an Italian duke, Duke mm-hmm. Ferrara. Um, and he's pulling back a curtain in his private rooms and showing a portrait of his last wife to uh, the representative of his next wife's family. And he says, just mentions, oh, yes, and by the way, I had her killed. Um, which I was think it's an astonishing, I don't know, revelation because this man is so completely assured that what he did was justified and pretty fair enough. He doesn't mind telling his next wife's family about this. You know, he doesn't see anything that there could be a problem with that. And I really like one of my favorite bits is the ending of it where he's saying, oh, wait a minute, you know, we, we'll both go down together. And obviously this man's legging it as fast as he can. Um, <laughs> he's terrified of the psychopath. But so I, I suppose when I, I, start, I was thinking about that poem just idly and I know exactly when it was. It was just before the pandemic started because I was waiting outside my friend's house for my mm-hmm. daughter to come out of a play date. Um, and that was the last play date she had for quite a long time. And I was just wondering whether this poem was based on real events because some of his other dramatic monologues are. And so I was looking up on my phone and within minutes I had a name, Lucrezia de Medici. And then this portrait um, was mm-hmm. downloading on my phone without the tiger stripes, I should say. <laughs> and uh, as soon as I... So it downloaded very slowly. So I Mm -hmm. saw her kind of brow and then her eyes and then her mouth. And it was a weird experience because as soon as I saw her face, I just knew that I had my next novel, that I felt that she, because I think she looks quite anxious. Mm -hmm. A lot of Renaissance portraits, their expressions are quite blank. They're very expressionless. But she looks quite worried. She looks quite apprehensive. And it just seemed to me that she looked like she had a story to tell. And I just knew that I wanted to imagine what that story might be. And I realize we just opened this event with the main character is going to die. I understand that. But, 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 but we are going to go spoiler free in this conversation because there are some amazing things that happen in this novel. And I will tell you, every single one of them is a total delight. So if you haven't read it, I am not spoiling it for you. If your neighbor spoils it for you, if your book club spoils it for you, I am sorry. But I am not them. So if you have a question at the end, please, please think about whether or not you were spoiling because this really is such a claustrophobic, creepy, exhilarating reading experience. I mean, this little girl is untamable. And I, little girl, I, I don't mean to sound dismissive. I mean, 16 in 1560 is different from 16 now. But at the same time, this, she's unprepared. She is unprepared for life at court. Her mama is not, well, her mama is her mama. <laughs> Let's talk about this girl for a second, because you've got the sort of thread of the thing. You've got Browning, you've got the portrait, and now you have to make her. How'd that start? Um, Well, there's not a huge amount known about Mm -hmm. Lucrezia at all. She is someone whose history is really written in white. Um, So, I mean, obviously she comes from a very famous family, and most people have heard of the Medicis. Her father was Cosimo de' Medici, who was the Grand Duke of Tuscany. And her mother was Eleanor de Toledo. And they, I think, really unusually for their milieu, they really loved each other. I mean, mm-hmm. their marriage was sort of partially arranged, as, as Lucrezia's was. But I think they very unusually absolutely adored each other. And even more unusually, they were faithful to each other. And even more unusually than that, when <laughs> Cosimo was called away from Florence um, to see to various matters of his region, he uh, used to cede his rule to Eleonora, which was, I think, an absolute shock and a revelation to everybody at court, you know, all these kind of this army of uh, secretaries and advisors and mm-hmm. lawyers, because suddenly they had to report to a woman of all things. <laughs> um, but actually, Eleonora was more than up for the job. She was highly intelligent, incredibly capable. She knew everything about religion and politics and um, you know economics of, the, of her region and she her whole purpose in life was to rebuild Tuscany mm-hmm. into this incredible superpower she also I'd like to say had 12 children in 15 years she was a, yeah she's a very capable woman and Cosmo absolutely adored her if you go to the Uffizi gallery you'll see just how many 
portraits of his wife he commissioned. Mm-hmm. I mean, there are so many of them, her at different ages and slightly different, very ornate dresses. And one of the things I really like about them is that the most expensive colour that you could have in Renaissance Florence or in the Renaissance time was blue because it had to be made from powdered lapis lazuli. And one of her portraits is it's just her in this incredible dress and all the background is just blue, loads of blue. And I love the idea that Cosmo just said, I want so, more than <laughs> lapis lazuli than you've ever seen in your life behind my wife in this picture. But anyway, so they, when they were apart, they mm-hmm. used to write to each other because they adored each other right. so much. They wrote to each other quite a lot. And their letters are an amazing resource of information about the sort of political and the domestic life of the, the palace in Florence. So, I mean, in among all the kind of business of the province, right. there's a, quite a lot of um, detail about their home life. So they lived in the Palazzo Vecchio and they had eight children who survived, you know, beyond infancy. And, uh, you know, I think any the, the content of the letters would be familiar to anyone who's mm-hmm. a parent in the audience. There's a bit about somebody who's grown out of their shoes, so somebody else needs a new smock for winter. Somebody won't practice their lute. You know, the, the classics tutor's not working out. It's, all, it's very familiar. And there's an awful lot. It's very clear from the letters that Cosimo, the dad, really favours Isabella, one of Lucrezia's sisters. And uh, Eleanor really loves her sons. And Lucrezia just, she, she's quite unmentioned. She doesn't make mm-hmm. much of a, an appearance in these letters. There's one reference to her being a bit of a daydreamer and not concentrating in her lessons. But other than that, there's not much really at all. Um, and I just got the impression of her as somebody underloved and um, undernoticed in a sense. Undernoticed, but also a little stubborn and a little wild. And really, I mean, I understand that's all of you, but she's a pleasure to follow. And Dad has a zoo in the basement. This is not a spoiler. A zoo in the basement, which is based on real life. And all I can think is the smell. Why would you have that in your basement? But that's just me. But Dad, Cosimo, is also educating his daughters. Yeah. That was wild to me. I was just like, I thought they were just sort of sent off to do embroidery and yeah. paint and sit in the corner. And Well, it fascinates me that, you know, obviously... Cosmo and Eleonora, they, the future for their boys was to be a ruler, right. you know, to be a politician, to be a soldier. But the girls were destined to make politically advantageous mm-hmm. marriages with other regions and other powers. At the same time, you know, obviously their destiny was to be decorative and to be a kind of consort and a companion and also, you know, to produce a string of heirs and consolidate other dynasties in other areas. But at the same time, they did um, really unusually educate their daughters alongside their sons. And that's no kind of mean feat because in, you know, in Renaissance Florence, they had the best education that money can buy. They had the best court artists teaching them drawings. They could mm-hmm. speak five or six different languages. They knew everything about the, what we now call the classics. They called the antiquities. So, you know, these girls are highly, highly educated. Mm-hmm. I suppose what I believe when I write books about the past is that although the world changes all the time, you know, it changes unrecognizably mm-hmm. since Lucrezia's day, I don't think the human spirit and the human heart changes that much. And although, yes, Lucrezia was 15 when she had to go off and marry this right. 27-year-old man she didn't know and possibly had never met, I don't think that she became a decorative, silent, acquiescent wife. I think all that edu- where does all that education, that right. intelligence go? It has to go somewhere. Mm-hmm. It has to have an outlet. And this is where she's not fully prepared, though, for court life because we've all read enough and I'm quite happy that I've never had to experience court life outside of someone's <laughs> novel because... I would not last 20 minutes. I really would not last 20 no, minutes. No, well, I wouldn't either. I think, um, <laughs> I think I'd be in the basement with wild animals. Um, <laughs> I, think, and I think it must have been, my guess is it was very hard for Lucrezia to go from the Medici court right. to the Ferrara court because, I mean, for two reasons, really. I think the, the example she'd had of marriage was that of her parents. And like I said, they absolutely adored each other. Um, and I think her marriage to Alfonso is very different, mm-hmm. clearly, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> given, <laughs> given what may have happened. Um, but also, I think the, I got the impression anyway, the Medici court in Florence was quite, uh, it was a bit of a party town, actually. They mm-hmm. had lots and lots of banquets. They had tumblers. They had acrobats. They had loads of gambling. I think the Ferrara court was very, actually quite a lot more serious. And it was more to do with sort of theatre and recitation. And I think actually... For Alfonso and his family, probably slightly looked down on the Medici's as a little bit um, nouveau riche, a bit flashy, <laughs> because the Medici's a generation or two before had been merchants. I'm so sorry to shock you all in that way. 
Um, but, you know, and the Alfonso's family, by contrast, was a kind of very ancient noble family that went all the way back to the Roman Empire. But, you know, Isabella gets in that dig when her little sister's back. Be careful at court. They have painters there and poets and composers. They're dangerous people. And, okay. Did I laugh? Yes, I laughed quite a lot. Good. I mean, it's a great line because clearly I, everyone is coming at this from different sides and everyone is trying to figure out how to maintain their power. I think what I found so interesting about it is obviously this is Italy before it was Italy. You know, mm -hmm. Italy at this mm -hmm. point we, you know, didn't exist and it was just a kind of a collection of various city states, some of whom had good relationships with the other and some of whom really didn't. Mm -hmm. You know, so it was, I think it must have been a very stressful and tense job actually to rule one of these regions i don't think it was an easy job and i think actually in a sense alfonso um lucrezia's husband cosimo lucrezia's father were very good rulers i think by comparison but at the same time what i think what fascinated me as i read more and more about the renaissance yeah. is that we think of it as this apogee of beauty and elegance which of course it is you know we all know the paintings and the sculptures and the architecture but at the same time there's a kind of interesting dichotomy about the renaissance is that you can't have those paintings and those sculptures without people or without men like Alfonso and Cosimo. And for them to be successful rulers, they have to be quite ruthless and they have to be quite brutal. So it was just this interesting push-pull between beauty and brutality about the whole era that fascinated me. It's also where your language shifts from Hamnet, because it does feel like a bit of a departure for you. And I'm wondering if that's partially because we're at court. You know, and certainly Hamnet is Hamnet, but court changes a lot. Well, in a sense, actually, all, in a, all the things that I learnt for writing Hamnet, even though actually Hamnet and Lucrezia lived about 30 years apart right. in time, um, all the things I learnt for Hamnet actually were a kind of false friend. I almost had to kind of consciously push them out of my right. mind um, because the life of, a, of an 11-year-old boy in rural Warwickshire mm -hmm. Uh, is actually miles apart, worlds away, away from Lucrezia's life, which is, you know, one of, again, let's not forget, enormous privilege, but actually enormous lack of choice, you know. I mean, she was basically right. imprisoned mm -hmm. in, these, in these kind of gilded cages. It was too dangerous for Lucrezia and her siblings to leave the palazzo, to leave the protection of the palazzo. Her father, Cosimo, had had so many attempts on his life that he never... Um, he never left at the gates of the palazzo without wearing chainmail underneath his clothing, which anyone who's ever been to Italy in the summer will know how horrifically <laughs> uncomfortable that must have been. But in terms of the language, you know, I had, and again, actually, the language from Hamnet is so, in, you know, English rural, mm -hmm. um, sort of, you know, 16th century English is right. so different from this. And I, I did a bit of research into the languages they would have been speaking. And, mm -hmm. and I was told by a very reliable linguistic historian mm -hmm. that actually they weren't speaking Italian anyway. You know, obviously they were, all these different regions had their own dialect and their own language, and none of them were very close to modern Italian. But the one that um, seems to have changed, the one that's closest to modern Italian is in fact Tuscan, which is what um, Lucrezia mm -hmm. would have spoken. So I, <laughs> I began each of my days, I mean, and I did, I, I did live in Italy for a while. I used to live near Florence, so I spoke a bit of Italian, and I'm not very good at languages, but I did start every day with a, an online language course um, just to try and get my ear or my head right. into that kind of grammar and those, the verb forms and the, the pronounless verbs. It was just, yeah, it just fascinated me. So I wanted to get as close as I could to the language they would have been speaking. And yet we're still in the present tense as you're telling us everything. Which is so inviting. And I know I mentioned the claustrophobia of the storytelling early on, but it's because this woman is trapped. I mean, she is absolutely trapped. And it's the choicelessness and it's the physical containment. It's all of it. And yet the present tense. I mean, there were times where I had to remind myself that we were talking about sort of, you know, 1560 kind of thing. So that deliberate choice does that keep you in the story as well, or is it just how it needs to be told? Well, I always try and leave decisions like tense and grammar um, up to, I think, what Rudyard Kipling called the other side of my mm -hmm. head. I, I always think that novels and stories and narratives will find their own shape, a right. bit like you pouring water into a mm -hmm. vessel. It will find the shape of the vessel, the find the shape it needs to be in. Um, and actually, I have been... So the, so the, the kind of the sort of current story, the story where Lucrezia arrives at the country villa right. and thinks that Alfonso is about to kill her. 
that is in the present tense. But of course, the other part of her life is is all in the past tense mostly. But I suppose, you know, and I think I I do leave that up to a sort of instinct in a sense. Right. You know, there have been times when I've been writing not so much this book, but other books where I've been st- going back to something that I've started. You know, mm-hmm. a chapter that I've started, and I suddenly find myself slipping into a different tense or a different, you know, mm-hmm. first person or second person or third person. And if that happens again and again, I always think, well, actually, I have to listen to whatever it is that's pulling me this way. Right. I once started one of my books, which is called Hand That First Tell Mine. I think I'd written about maybe a third, maybe even a half in the first person singular. And I suddenly realized that it was wrong and it needed to be in the third person singular. So I had to go through the whole <laughs> that thing. Changing every I to she and every mm-hmm, mm-hmm. me to I. And that was a really dull fortnight, let me tell you. But that brings me to the structure, too, because we're flipping back and forth in time. Mm-hmm. I personally love that as a device. But I can also see other people saying, well, I just want to sit with this moment. So how did you know when you had the right structure? I mean, if I remember correctly, you're not a linear writer. You sort of do what you need to do and then work around it. Or Yeah, when I when my first draft, um, I had started... Not with the realisation that Crazy has that she thinks Alfonso is going to kill her. I'd started with their wedding. Mm -hmm. And it was really funny. As I was reading back that draft, I just felt this doesn't, it doesn't feel right. It feels like wearing a pair of shoes that doesn't fit. Right. Um, It just really bugged me. And I knew that it wasn't right. So I rely very much on different coloured post-it notes. And I had them all up on my wall. And I was sort of looking at the whole shape of the structure. And I thought, this is all wrong. I need to, I need to resort all these, um, all these post-it notes. And I did at that point, I read a few literary thrillers. So I went back and I read Daphne du Maurier's My Cousin Rachel, which mm-hmm. is an absolutely fantastic novel. I love it. And she's, she's, well, she's better known, obviously, for Rebecca, and rightly yep. so. But My Cousin Rachel is brilliant. And I was really interested in the way that she constantly unseats the reader's expectations again and again. You know, you start the novel and you think Rachel is evil. And then du Maurier turns it and you think, oh, actually, maybe she's not so bad. And then she turns it again and again. and. I thought that was brilliant. Mm-hmm. And I re- also read The Woman in White again and Patricia Highsmith. Um, and I was just interested in this idea of creating this idea. And, you know, I wanted readers, in a sense, to walk in lockstep with Lucrezia. And you have this, she has this realisation that Alfonso is going to kill her. And then she has a kind of, well, actually, maybe I'm wrong. And am I imagining it? And is he erudite and charming and kind? Or is he actually a psychopath? So I wanted readers, in a sense, to to be with her while she's having those uncertainties. And speaking of literary inspirations for a second, I mean, you've talked about your love of Alice Munro. You've talked about Bronte and Jane Eyre and Molly Keene and George Eliot, Margaret Atwood, Jennifer Egan and William Boyd. Those were the last sort of set that you and I talked about. But I am holding one of the best books I have read in the last year in my hand. I have destroyed my copy, and it's Maggie's fault, and I will explain in a second. It's O Caledonia by Elizabeth Barker. And it is extraordinary. And Maggie wrote the introduction. And I destroyed my copy because I was warned ahead of time that there are so many great lines. And I'm one of the, I'm a full body reader. I cannot be the only full body reader in this space. There is not a single page where something amazing happens. And it does also open with the murder of a young girl. And you don't need to know who did it. And it goes back through her life. You will read it in a single sitting. It is so satisfying. It did make me think of Great Granny Webster, though, that Caroline Blackwood Blackwood novel, where I was like, is she going to turn into Great Granny Webster? (laughs) Like, And then there's Lila and whatnot. I just want to bring this book up for a second because no one knew Elspeth for a really long time. You've called this one of your favorite, favorite, favorite books. And I have to say, I came to it very recently because you wrote the introduction. (laughs) I am the person who will buy something and read the introduction and then dive in just because I like the writer who wrote the introduction, which is, I suppose, how these things are supposed to work. But let's talk about O Caledonia for a second. How did you discover this book? Because I feel like there's a tiny bit of Janet, the girl from... I never thought of that. Yeah, there's <laughs> a tiny, I, I think there's a tiny bit of Janet yeah. in The Marriage Portrait. So I came to that book mm-hmm. when I was, I don't know, exa- I was 24, and I had just booked myself on a creative writing residential course. Mm-hmm. So in, um, in Britain, they have these things called the Arvon Foundation, where you can go on. A, it's a five and a half day course, residential. Right. It's in the middle of nowhere. It was, this one happened to be in the farmhouse where Sylvia Plath and Ted Hughes lived, just as a little aside. 
And one of the tutors was Elspeth Barker. It's in the middle of the oh, Yorkshire okay. Moors, in the middle of nowhere. Okay. So I read it before I went. And Elspeth, um, I should say Elspeth died quite recently. And she was, and she's exactly as you might expect her to be if you've read that book. Very imposing with this kind of raven black hair mm. and piercing blue eyes. And, and I had handed in about 20,000 words probably of what ended up sort of being my first novel. It was actually a complete dog's dinner at that point. I didn't know what I was doing. So I handed it in and Elspeth said to me, I want to see you in the library. And I was really terrified. I thought, God, she's read it and she thinks it's so bad that she's going to ask me to leave. Right. And so I went in and she was looking really, and it was very kind of, I mean, it is, you know, it's this farmhouse in Yorkshire and it was very dark and there was just a firelight and she was sitting there like kind of Whistler's grandmother. And I thought, oh, no, this is going to be terrible. And she said, you have to carry on. And when you finish, I'm going to send it to my agent. And I was so, it was so shocking. And also because it was her. And right. I read this incredible book. Right. And, and actually, I was so shocked that I ran out of the farmhouse. And it was the depths of winter. And I was so excited. And I fell into a ditch up to about here with icy water. What? <laughs> I did. What? And at Wait one point, I thought, <laughs> I know, it was a middle, it was pitch dark. <laughs> And I thought, I'm just, I can't get out. I'm going to drown here. And I'll never finish my book. But luckily, I did get out. <laughs> but Elspeth is, and Elspeth, I know that her daughter told me that she, because this book was put back into print. Right. It'd been out of print for a long mm -hmm. time. And her daughter told me that she managed to see it in print just before she died. I oh, know, that makes me really makes happy. Me so, so she knew that her book was back, back in print. The way Maggie uses place is not dissimilar to what happens in the Scottish Highlands in very terrible ways. Um, and also party dresses are a pain, man. Party dresses are just a pain for That's everyone true. in every century. No one has fun in a party dress. I'm <laughs> they sorry. They really don't, do they? Like, can no. we just all wear jeans to everything, yeah. please? I'm My daughters sorry. don't have any party dresses. I just, yeah, just said, no, I, it's not I, a good idea. You know, it's <laughs> just, that's all I'm going to say about party dresses, but really they are terrible, terrible yeah. things. I do want to leave some time though for audience questions because we can keep going for a year and a half. We don't have a third mic, but it's a small enough space. So if anyone has any questions, feel free to yell and we'll figure it out from there. And, you know, we'll see what happens. But yeah. Where were the letters between your parents? Where did you actually come out? Did you have access to them? Well, if you find there's lots of biographies of the Medici's, obviously. And the ones that I really love, there's one by Paul Strathern and one by Caroline Murphy. I myself cannot read Renaissance Tuscan which may shock you to learn. Um, but <laughs> there are other people who have and who've re written up and, and translated these letters. Um, and actually, Ellen Nora, I think, I think I'm right in saying she was writing in 16th century Spanish. because she, Obviously, she was Spanish. So weirdly, I think the letters are in different languages. And I think, I think she could speak Tuscan, but she couldn't write in it, I think. So yeah, that, and if you, in the back of the book, there's a, a list of the books that I read well as, and you can find all kinds of things in there. Yeah. Did you start? So the writing of this book was completely bookended by the pandemic for me because I had the idea in February 2020. And of course, if the world had been working normally, I would have gone quite quickly to Italy just to do some research and walk about the locations and things. But of course, as doesn't need to be said that the world was not working normally. So in a sense, I wrote the book really counterintuitively. I had to write it. And then only then at the end of you know, when travel restrictions were finally lifted a year ago now, it was September when I went last year, um, could I actually go? So I was really nervous because I, I did used to live near Florence. So I knew that city quite well. And I had been in the Palazzo Vecchio, but I'd never set foot in Ferrara. So I was really nervous because I thought, what if I've got it all wrong? You know, obviously, you can learn so much from books, but there's nothing that can replace the experience of standing in a corridor, you know, in the Castello um, in Ferrara or you know, I remember standing when I finally got there, looking up at the ceiling and realizing that all on all the frescoes superimposed were the reflections of the moat, which was, you know, to several stories below. And I thought, well, you know, that's why that's why you have to come, because it's that kind of detail you can never get from, you know, Google Images or you know, Google Maps or whatever. So I wrote it um, pretty much uh, throughout the whole pandemic. It was quite, you know, like everybody else, I was stuck at home. I was like many of us, I was homeschooling three children and baking lots of bread and making lots of meals and all that, all that stuff that we were all doing. But I was very lucky that I had this escape hatch of escaping to Renaissance Florence, which is not a bad place to be <laughs> when you're armchair traveling. Did anything surprise you while you were writing this book? Yes, there were, there were lots of things, actually. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. when I, one of the things I 
thought when I set out. You know, I think I think writing a book, you start off with one idea, and writing a book, you're constantly altering that idea. Or I am. Mm-hmm. I'm not much of a planner. I I usually set out with an idea where the book will go, but I don't plan it too much before. Right. But when I set out, I wanted to be. I thought I should be quite even-handed with Alfonso. You know, because it's not known for sure whether he murdered her. You know, there are some historians, and there were, certainly there were rumours at the time that he poisoned her. But there are other historians who say, you know, she just died of natural causes. So mm-hmm. I thought I don't want to condemn an innocent man who hasn't until he's not guilty until proven otherwise. But then <laughs> I, <laughs> I read about uh, that he something he was quite proud of and he was quite happy for people to know because I think he felt it sent a message was that when he discovered one of his sisters was having an affair with the head of the guardsman of their castello, he sentenced the man to be murdered, mm-hmm. to be strangled. And he forced his sister to watch as the man was being strangled. Mm. I have a really kind of strong memory of shutting the cover of the book where I read that and thinking, right, Alfonso, I'm coming for you. Because <laughs> I thought that's, his, that's the act of a very disordered, psychotic mind. I think people who are most interested in power will tell themselves any possible story to maintain that. And it sounds like he had moments where he was on very shaky ground. <laughs> well, I think he he had when he married Decretzi, he had only been Duke. His father had just died. He mm-hmm. had only been Duke for a few months, and his whole court was in a, quite a lot of disarray. His mother had been exiled to France for practicing Protestantism, and mm-hmm. he needed to prove that he was up to the job of being the Duke. And really crucially, he had to produce an heir very quickly. Otherwise, his duchy was going to fall into the hands of the French, possibly. So... He was a man. I mean, you know, obviously I'm not saying all this as a kind of excuse for murdering uh, his wife. He was under a lot of pressure, you know, poor man. But um, <laughs> Haven't we heard that before? I think we've yeah, heard that before. We've heard that quite a lot before. But, you know, I think there was pressure upon him to be, act in a certain way and to produce heirs. And Lucrezia just was a means to that end, I think. You know, I think all of your characters are a product of their time, but it's hard not to root for Lucrezia. It's really hard not to root for them. Even when she's being a stubborn, 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 let me fix it all, and I haven't got the first clue, and I just saw a hand at the back. Yeah, I've stuck on the research question for a second, but it's not exactly that it's clear that you've done, you know, thorough research. But what is your relationship with it as you're at the, you know, you're at the polished table, the circle of fur? You're, you know, do you put it aside and you're, you've internalized it as part of I mean, I don't have I don't have a kind of a period of research and then a period of writing. It's nothing as organized as that. I tend to kind of do it a bit as I go along. You know, I find that I might read a book or a biography or a history book and it might spark off lots of ideas. So I might go off and write that. And then I, I tend to kind of write the book until I feel I reach a sort of a gap in the floorboards and I think, okay, now I need to know about this. But I think also, I do really think that, especially with a historical novel, you've got to be really careful about not putting in too much of your homework. I have a particular kind of uh, bugbear of his novels about the past that you read and you feel as though the writer really wants you to know that they've done all their homework and they've got full marks in their history exams. <laughs> you know, I hate nothing more than reading a book and you, you're kind of submerged in a narrative and you're reading something and it says she picks up the telephone, which is made of Bakelite in any form of plastic. You know, I hate that. It really gets on my nerves because instantly you're pulled out of this narrative world. And so I do think that you need, you know, in order to create a scene in a, I don't know, a Renaissance palazzo, you, you need to know what the floor's made of and what the walls look like and what the clothes feel like and how the hair is and if they were eating, what kind of food it would be or what the plates were made of. But actually in your final draft, you need to make sure that 99% of that is invisible. You want to get rid of it. You know, you need it to know, to be confident to do it, but then you've got to get rid of it at the end. You need to, anything that's weighed down with its own sense of importance or history or any kind of teaching, you know, yeah. you want to be preaching or teaching at your reader. Have you read Matrix by Lauren Groff? I love that. Right? Book. Yeah, it's right? fantastic. I mean, but the way yeah, she yeah. sort of delineates the change in seasons and the success mm. of the Abbey, where all of a sudden you've gone from, And now there are pigs running around and da da da. And she does it in a single line. And this is actually something Ian McEwan does in lessons as well, where it's just you get this single line of detail and you know exactly where you are in time and space. And the nun, you know, the Abbey is getting much more successful because suddenly they've gone from 11 nuns to 50. 
and da 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 da. And then she gets to ride that horse through the front door of that house. And I was like, who hasn't wanted to ride a horse through the front door of a house? Yeah, yeah it's a fabulous book. I love, love, love. But it's exactly what you're talking about. It's the same idea where Lauren did her homework, but if we had been given the details of the no. Yeah, yeah. Please no. Just ride the horse through the front door. Please just ride the horse through the front door. Oh, wait, more hands right here. And then we'll do the other. I'm just curious as a writer, what it feels like to finish a book and go back eight years later, five years later. Do you ever think to yourself, I wish I could choose something? Yeah, I could pick up my, what I think of as my reading copy and show you what it looks like. Because, yeah, you can't stop. And actually, I find that certainly you need you need a trusted friend or a trusted editor to literally wrestle the manuscript out of your grip at the end of it, because otherwise you could just, you could actually, or I could anyway, just go on finessing and writing and moving around adverbs for the rest of time. And I'd actually be quite happy. I'd quite enjoy that. But (laughs) at some point you have to let go of it. And it's hard. I, I don't know how other writers feel, but I feel it's a huge sense of grief. I think actually when you finish a bit, I mean, at the same time, you know, it's a, it's a, you do feel like, you know, a sense of accomplishment and, pleasure in finishing but I do feel I find it really hard to let go of them and I know actually that I've made a kind of rule with myself that when I get back from this trip when I get home I'm going to have to dismantle my Lucrezia pin boards and I really don't want to do it even though I finished it you know whenever it was in <laughs> March they're still up and I know that I've got another book I want to write so so I've had i would said to myself okay you'll do it when you come back from America but I hate it I really don't want to take them down I still have a kestrel feather from when I wrote Hamlet up on my pin board because I've gone I'll never get rid of that Wait, there was another hand over. Um, do you think this is the genre you're going to write in? Because uh, I, I love, I read, I just read um, Instructions for the oh, okay. I loved it. And it was, it's obviously so different, you know, from Hamlet. And are you going to stick to this type of genre? And you said you already have a topic. I don't know if you can share it with us. Well, not necessarily. I mean, I think, I don't, I don't really, I try actually to avoid thinking about genre or what the book will be when I finish or what kind of pigeonhole it could be slotted into I try and steer really consciously away from that kind of question I think and I I think I also really deliberately didn't think to myself I am writing a historical novel I wanted to kind of treat it as I would any any other novel particularly but I mean I, I was really glad actually during 20 and 21 that I wasn't writing a contemporary novel actually because I think, I don't know how everyone else felt, but I felt at that time I didn't know what the contemporary world was going to be. You know, it felt so unstable and it was like walking on cracked ice. Mm. You know, we had no idea what the world was going to be like when we emerged from this. I mean, you know, thankfully we are emerging from it, I hope, fingers crossed. But I remember thinking, I'm really glad I'm not in the middle of a book about the present day world because, it, you know, I don't know whether the world will be the same as it was when I might have begun that. And also I have I do have a bit of a superstition about talking about books that I haven't finished. So I'm a little bit uh, loath to talk about the book that I'm, I've only just very started. It just feels, particularly when you haven't even, I mean, I'm not anywhere near the end of a first draft, but I think the first draft is such a, a particular time. And, you know, the book feels so fragile in a sense. It's like a sort of, um, I don't know, it's like, it's like a butterfly's wing. You don't want to even breathe on it in case it all just disappears, you know. But I can, I can say it's set in Paris. That's all I can say. Okay, as long as you're working, on, we're good. As long as, there's, as long as there's something coming, we're okay. And I forgot to tell you earlier, I have a new favorite word because of you as I was researching. Chronophanasia. Oh, I'm so oh, glad. We, we, we all need this word. I'm telling you, we all need it. But, you know, I, I do a lot of research for these things. You may not see it, but I do a lot of it. Stealing time. So the usage being social media is chronophanasic. And the fact that you are not on social media, I am so jealous. <laughs> I, I am yeah, so try and guard against it. Well, you know, we do what we can, but it's part of, you know, a bookseller's repertoire at this point. But there are times where I'm like, yes, yes, it is deeply chronophanagic. And I see that hand. So we're going to end with your question. How do you come to the next story? Right? Is it just you do some brainstorming? You do a, a strong outline? Or how do you actually come to the next story? Like, it's time to write a new book. The next book, how do you how do you get there? I think the interesting thing is it's different every single time. I think it's a bit like having babies. I remember when I had my first child, you know, there's an enormous learning curve and you have to learn so much about feeding and keeping them clean and keeping them happy. And and then when I got pregnant for the second time, I thought, it's okay, I know about babies now. And then I had my second child and I thought, oh my 
God, this is a completely different person. I have to learn everything else all over again. I've got to reinvent the wheel every time. And I think, I do think books are a bit like that. You know, I think sometimes the idea, like with this one, can just, I mean, I wish it happened more often, actually, like this, but it just lands in your lap, almost fully formed, in a sense. And sometimes, you know, it can sort of build up for years. And often, I, when I finish a book, I know what the next one's going to be, and sometimes the next one after that. And sometimes I finish a book, and I think, I have no idea, and you... You have to sort of walk about with your antennae extended, thinking, you know, where, where's it going to come from? I don't know. But so I don't, I mean, and I wish I could say this is the place where novel ideas come from because I would love to go there more often. And then we could all go and pick something off the shelf of ideas. But I don't know. There's no, there's no answer to that, really. I wish I knew. If anyone knows, please tell me. We can be patient. We can just sit here quietly and be patient, really, I swear. Maggie O'Farrell, thank you so much for joining us at Barnes & Noble tonight. Thank you, thank you for coming. Thank you for listening. Poured Over is a Barnes & Noble production. To help other readers find us, please rate and review the show wherever you listen to podcasts.